people for over 110 years, primarily in the life insurance and retirement space. So this is something that we have a tremendous, tremendous amount of history. But I would also point out the relationship that WSB and Transamerica have together. Because I think that's the most important aspect of what we do is the relationship that we have together. Because you represent Transamerica, you're a part of Transamerica. And in a certain way, we we built a company that is designed and, and built specifically for WFG. So when I'm talking about the FFIUL, you should be proud to know this was a product that was built specifically for WFG. Right? It wasn't the Transamerica uh, mathematicians that came up with the benefits of this product. It was it was coach, right? It was WFG leadership. And so I would be proud to share our history and our story. The fact that we're a multi-billion dollar company, we paid out over $145 million in claims last year, only on policies written by WFG. Now, the second thing that I want to talk about, especially when I'm talking about how life insurance can help a family are the tax benefits. Because everyone is searching for a way to make it to and through retirement. Right now, it's about 65% of Americans, they would say their number one financial concern is what? Taxes, it's preparing for retirement and to do so in a successful way where I can avoid the implications of, of tax consequences. And so we're able to help someone answer this question. I, but the one that I love asking, when you sit down with someone, you have to know ahead of time that one of their top concerns is preparing for retirement. And my favorite question to ask is, in retirement, do you think, it doesn't really matter left or right, which side of the aisle you sit on, do you think taxes are likely to go down in the future? No. No. But people kind of religiously put their money into a tax me later bucket. So whether you're talking to an individual or a business owner, the question you should ask them is, what is your plan to generate retirement on, or to generate income in retirement on a tax-free basis? You have to ask everyone that question. What's your plan to generate income in retirement on a tax-free basis? This is something that, that we can help you with. Number three is the safety. And number four is going to be the growth that we can help the clients achieve. So when it comes to safety, what am I referring to? The floor, no loss, right? The floor on the FFIUL is, I believe, the highest in the industry. I, I, I have not come across another company that has a floor that is above 0%. So when you're talking to people, I want to talk to them about how we're going to make their money work for them. And you should educate people on the rule of 72 and the importance of, of getting every extra percent that you can get. But what I want to talk about and really emphasize is the fact that we have safety features inherently built into the product so that you know, even in a down market, your money is going to be safe, secure, and protected. Does that make sense? Now, we offer opportunities for growth up to 15% in our global index account. And that's one of the highest caps that you're going to see on such a high quality index. It is global index account has some of the highest historical returns. And it's something that the floor here is guaranteed. There's a guarantee on that floor. It could never be lower than positive 0.79%. The cap is not guaranteed. And I think that's something that's really, really important to point out to clients is that when you're buying an IUL, you want to make sure that you're doing business with the right company. All that an IUL really is is a promise, right? Any life insurance contract is just a promise that, hey, even in the worst case of scenarios, this company is going to fulfill this promise. And you want to make sure you're with a company that has a proven history of fulfilling their promises. And so when it comes to these cap rates, the fact that they can change should give you a little bit of cause for concern. And what I would impress upon people is that 
we launched the FFIUL in 2012. And so from 2012 until 2019, over the last seven years, we've changed the cap once. And it'd be really hard if I sold someone a policy and I said, hey, you're going to buy into this policy and it's a 15% cap. And then the very next month, we lower the cap and it's now 10%. Right? That'd be a difficult annual review. We changed the cap once in the last seven years and we actually raised the cap. So it was originally capped at 13.75%. We raised it to 15 and we applied that for all in force FFIULs as well. So help people to understand that when you do business with Transamerica, yes, it's a good, strong, reputable company, but also it's the home team. It, it, it's the team that really is on your side, right? And that's not our slogan, but we'll take it <laughs> because we have we have proof, right? We have more than a catchy slogan, we have proof over the last seven years. We maintain this strong cap, but we don't have any plans to lower. Sound good? Yeah. Now, the last thing to talk about are long-term care and critical illness benefits. Long-term care and critical illness benefits, to me, are what separates the Transamerica solution from any other company. And we can go through an illustration tonight, and we can talk about how our product illustrates um, and Michelle asked, actually asked me, she said, Will, I've got a, a prospective client. Uh, they're looking at a different company, Global Atlantic. Do you think that that's a solution that you guys can be? And I'm pretty good with the illustration, and so I know how to really maximize that. And I would assume that we can be really competitive. But to a certain degree, you can never have the most cash value for every single client, right? And I would never want to have the most cash value on that piece of paper for every single client because the illustration is not guaranteed, right? The illustration is a hypothetical that could or could not come true, right? Especially if a company maybe changes their caps or especially if they have a lower floor. And so that illustration is attractive, but it's not the most valuable thing to my client. And if I condition my client that Mr. or Mrs. Client, you should buy a Transamerica IUL because they show the most cash value out of any other company. If you condition your client that that's how they should be thinking, when another agent comes along and they say, oh, look, I got this hotshot company, they're gonna be a flash in the pan, they'll be gone in a year, but we can show you a really astronomical cash value, you should go with that one and replace the Transamerica policy. Don't condition the client to think that all that matters is cash value. Let's talk to them about the total package and the kind of protection that that needs to entail. If I could maybe show you cash value at age 70 of $200,000, I would say that's really competitive, right? $200,000, you can access that on an income tax-free basis. That's really competitive. But my client might say, well, an agent from State Farm was in here yesterday they show me an illustration and I can get 210,000 from them. So why should I go with trans if you guys only offer 200,000 and State Farm's offering me 210,000? Number one, this is all hypothetical, so there's absolutely no guarantee that's how it's going to perform. But number two, I think it's more important that when my client calls me at age 70, their biggest concern is not going to be, can I get an extra $10,000 of cash value there? Their biggest concern is going to be, will I just had a serious medical incident and I'm, I have an emergency. I just had a heart attack. I'm not going to be able to work anymore. What am I going to do if my small business is me, right? If I'm the only employee, how am I going to be able to move forward? We have this critical illness benefit that is so much more important than a little bit of hypothetical extra cash value. So talk to people about how these benefits work. There's a, there's a team on the, on the blue side out of Calabasas, and I was in their office, it was right after Mother's Day, so about a month ago, um, and we've got an SMB there, her name's Pat, and she's someone that, that I've, I've been with Transamerica for about seven years now. Um, and she's someone that I met very early in my career, and I, I've always just really appreciated my relationship with Pat. And, and I got a call from her, 
and it was about, I guess it would have been about a year and a half ago, and Pat was diagnosed with stage three thyroid cancer. And it was a pretty severe form of cancer. Um, and I kind of saw her as she went through this battle and she's the toughest person that I've met. I mean, she is so relentless and so tough. And so I kind of see her as I'm going in for BPMs or I'm going in for full timers meetings. And you can tell that it's taking a physical toll on her. And, and, and I know that she's battling and, and I know in the back of my mind, there's a couple stats that, that frighten me. One of them is that 42% of new cancer patients will lose their entire life savings within two years or less. 42%. Another one is that what's the number one cause of bankruptcy every single year in the US? Medical expenses. Medical expenses. Medical expenses. And so when I'm, when I'm talking to Pat, I know that she's been diagnosed with cancer. She called me and it couldn't have been six months ago. And she said, Will, I'm in the hospital. Things are not going well. I've recently been diagnosed by my doctor as having a terminal illness. You know what a terminal illness is? Yeah. What's the definition of terminal? Less than, less than a year. You've got less than a year left to live. She calls me, she says, Will, I've got, I've got a terminal illness now. I need to have surgery. The bills are adding up. I don't have any sort of idea how I'm going to pay for all of this, but I've got a policy with you guys and I need a little bit of help so that we can get this terminal illness claim accelerated and paid to, to, to get me the help that I'm going to need. And when you get a terminal illness diagnosis, it's, it's devastating, right? I mean, it's even in the best case of scenario, you've got 12 months or less to live. And so this all is going on in September, October. And I didn't see Pat at the Wealth Bowl, and I kind of knew why, because she's really sick. And I kind of thought, you know, I'm not going to be running into her at the office very often. And it was the Tuesday right after Mother's Day that I'm in this Calabasas office and I walk in and Pat Grasick is right there. And I was shocked that she has, she's walking with a, with a cane, but she looked great. And I gave her a big hug and I said, Pat, well, it's so good to see you. How are you feeling? How's everything been going? And she said, Will, I'm doing so great. I feel great. And I just got the news last month that the surgery we did, it was really experimental. It worked. And, and right now she is cancer free and in remission. Wow. And it was, I mean, and it was a terminal illness, right? Yeah. And, and, and I think about how important that is that you can pick up the phone and say, yeah, you have a plan in place that's gonna cover you for this. And most plans cover terminal illness, but most plans do not cover critical. And that's where we can take it a step farther. And why I will never forget this experience is one that she's, she's someone that I'm personally pretty close with, but number two, she told me, Will, I wish I could stay around for your training because I know you have a lot of good stuff to talk about, but I can't because my son just turned 18 years old and we're pulling him out of school. He's going to be graduating from high school at the end of this, uh, the end of this year, but um, we're pulling him out of school. We're taking him out to lunch for his birthday. And that was where I lost it. Because I'm thinking 18 years old, and he was probably preparing to spend the very first Mother's Day without his mom. And what a terrible experience that would be. And then you have your birthday right next. And it's going to be your first birthday without your mom. And then you go through high school graduation, and she's not there to see you walk across the stage. And so we're going to talk about cash value and, and preparing for retirement and all that good stuff. But make sure, first and foremost, what everything starts with is the right kind of protection is being able to confidently tell your client the most important thing for you is to protect your most vital asset and that is you you have a question yeah when you have to know that you have to you can get 50 percent of your death on the ffi you will you can get a hundred percent of your death benefit okay in that case you get better i go ask for money back <laughs> Everyone looks so no, hey, it's yours. You get to keep it, right? We accelerated it. We paid it to the client. There's a remaining death benefit. So I think on her case, her policy entitled her to accelerate 75%. And so she took 75% of that death benefit. I think it was like a half a million dollar policy. So she took 375,000 
and the remaining amount of 125,000 is still sitting in the policy as a remaining death benefit. Um, she she was asking me though before she left, hey, how can I how can I get more coverage now? How can I overfund and get can get that back? Um, so it was it's a really good problem to have. So can you do it? Can you not say that? No, I'm not have that we're not we're not we're not gonna give her any more coverage right now that she already had. And so add that will. I uh, have a co-worker who had leukemia, mm -hmm. but after, and he had Dr. America. Yeah. And they said it's just two policies. I didn't know if they're both Dr. America, and she was able to get the money. And uh, but she's well now. She's see, and that's the most important yeah. thing. That's the only thing, that, uh, right? Because yeah. could you imagine sitting down, one of your loved ones was diagnosed with cancer, one of your loved ones has a significant illness, and the doctor says, you know, I think that there's a path to treat this, and you say no. Uh, I can't, I can't afford that, right? Because the numbers on that, one in five people will refuse or delay treatment due to the high costs when it comes to cancer. One in five, one percent. So that's a really good point, and I think it just emphasizes that you have to have the right kind of protection first and foremost. Just having cash value is not just enough. You need to have the critical illness coverage, long-term care coverage everything like that. Make sense? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So now that we've got kind of the basics out of the way, let's talk about what we can do for business owners. So the first one that, that I see, and, and you see this one very commonly, is going to be a buy-sell. Has anyone heard of a buy-sell before? So with a buy-sell agreement, this is going to be good for people that maybe have partnerships. A lot of LLCs. But the general concept behind a buy-sell agreement is that if I have a small business, maybe it's a family business, maybe I'm in business with my brother and we both run a business together, and let's say that it's a landscaping business. My brother and I, we, we, we worked hard, we built up this landscaping business. One good question to ask business owners when you approach, what is your plan for exiting this business? What is your plan for retirement? Well, what is your exit strategy? You have to have an exit strategy. Are you gonna pass it along to a family member? Are you gonna give your brother the ownership? How is your brother going to, to earn that share of the ownership if we're 50-50 owners. With a buy-sell agreement, if I'm a 50% owner in my company and my brother is also a 50% owner, we might have a really good relationship for running this landscaping business. However, if I were to pass away, what is my succession plan for this business? Well, I would probably leave it as part of my estate and my wife would inherit my ownership of the business and my wife would now be a 50% owner of the business. Does that make sense? Well, my brother didn't sign up to go into business with my wife or with my children. My brother signed up to go into business with me. With a buy-sell agreement, I'm going to take out essentially a policy on my brother. And if he's going to pass away, I will be the beneficiary of this policy, and when he passes away, the amount that I receive from this policy, I'm going to use to buy his share of ownership from his family. Does that make sense? So you're going to need a legal document. It is going to need to be a legal document because we have to establish the terms of how much will I be selling my share of the business for, so that way I know that I'm going to get the right amount. But essentially, I would take out a policy on my brother, he would take out a policy on me, so that if either one of us were to pass away unexpectedly, well, now I know that I have the funds so that I can buy your family out and I will be in business for myself. That makes sense? Yes. 
a buy sell agreement is, is really, really common. If you come across this, um, what I would encourage you to do is to get all of the business information, the value of the business, how that value will determine what's the gross revenue and give us a call. Let us talk you through the steps of how we're going to structure this, but it's something that we do with, with a lot of regularity and very successfully. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions on buy sells? Question. Please. So should both owners agree into the agreement? I mean to the buy sell agreement Yes. Yes. Both. I will I will need to on that legal buy sell agreement. I'm going to need to indicate when I pass away, I will sell my share of the business to you for half a million dollars. And I must sell for half a million dollars to my brother. And when I pass away, he's going to receive half a million dollars from the policy and will then pay essentially for my share of the business. And that's how he's going to fund it. So the buy sell agreement is the legal document. The life insurance policy is the way that we fund it. Yes, sir. Let's say if the business grow big enough where the value is higher, are they able to change the value of the coverage? You can, yes. I mean, you, you, you'd likely want to apply for another policy as you move forward. Um, but yes, that's something that we can amend down the road. They would have to amend their, their buy-sell agreement before you could do that. Yeah. Yep. Any last questions on buy-sells? It would include anything that they have ownership in. So if it's a C corporation, that's not really going to work, but most S corps, LLCs, partnerships, um, you see a lot of like legal, uh, if you have a, uh, an attorney network, a lot of doctors networks, stuff like that. So yeah, as long as it's something that they have ownership. And it doesn't have to just be two ways, right? It could be a three-way buy-sell. It could be a ten way. The next one I want to talk about is a key person plan. And I think a key person plan is maybe the most important plan to be talking to business owners about that they overlook. A lot of times people will call me and will say, Will, I've got a business owner. Um, can we set up a group policy for all their employees? And we don't do any group insurance. WFG does not do any group insurance. So the answer to that is going to be no, unless the WFG platform changes. However, that doesn't mean that we can't help that business owner, especially if they're 100% owner of the business. One thing I would want to talk to them about are key persons to their organization, key persons to their business. Do you have any top salespeople? Do you have anyone that has some very strong industry knowledge that you wouldn't be able to necessarily operate as well without? An example of this may be if I am a restaurant owner. And let's say that I am someone who, who owns a restaurant and I've got the best chef in the world. And this guy is, is my partner in this, but He's someone who's highly compensated, that I pay well. However, if he were to pass away, what would happen to my restaurant? The value can go down. Everything's going to change. Everything's going to change pretty dramatically. Talk to business owners about who is key to their organization, who is key to the success of your business. When it comes to key person, you are going to be looking for someone who is an employee, with no ownership. Employee with no ownership, we can't set this up for the business owner themselves. And I'll explain why, but think about who is key to their organization. If I lost a top salesperson, I could very easily put a number on how much that's going to impact my business. Generally, we look at a maximum of 10 times the employee's income. So if I have a key employee and maybe they're making $50,000 a year and that's the revenue that they bring in, that's how much I pay them. If they're making $50,000 a year, the most coverage that I could take out on them would be 10 times their income. 
So if I have this top chef and he's very, very important to my organization, maybe I pay him $75,000 a year and he's going to be tremendous. If this chef passes away, my business is going to be hurt. So the insured is the employee. The owner of the policy is going to be the business and the beneficiary is going to be the business as well. If my chef passes away, my business is going to be at a loss. We may have to shut down altogether. He is that integral, that key to my business. So because of this, I'm going to take out a quarter of a million dollar policy on this individual. He is my employee. He is the one that we are underwriting. I'm going to be paying the premiums. I'm going to be the owner of the policy. If it builds up any cash value, who gets to access the cash value? The business. The owner. I get to access the cash value. And if he passes away, I become the beneficiary. I receive that 250000 because it's my business that is going to be at a loss. Does that make sense? With this, one of the first questions you're going to get, is that a tax deduction? No, this is not a tax deduction. Not a tax deduction and the reason why I'm going to be paying the premium, so that's after tax dollars. However, I'm going to be the beneficiary. And when I receive that money, that's going to be 100% income tax free. I'm the owner, I'm the beneficiary. There is no tax benefits on the premium that I pay, but there is on the debt benefit, on the cash value that I'm going to receive. Make sense? Yes. When you write a key person policy, always submit it with a cover letter. That's a really important step is to submit it with a cover letter and tell us who this person is, why they're key to the company or the organization, how you arrived at the amount of coverage that you're going to be buying them, right? If someone is the, um, if someone's the, the front receptionist at a dentist's office and you're going to be submitting a policy for a half a million dollars, you need to explain to us why this receptionist is a key employee that is worth a half a million dollars to your business. Does that make sense? Yeah. So be prepared to give us a cover letter and explain why this person is key and how you arrived at the amount of coverage that you're looking for. Any questions on key person? Please. How about if that uh, key person leave the company, how will the insurance go? Oh, that's a really good point. You know, we look at at the time of the application, you have to have justification for who the owner is and who the insured is. So at the time of the application, we would actually make you submit an extra form that is needed for employer-owned life insurance. The employee signs off and says, yes, I understand that my employer is going to own a policy on me. However, if this individual leaves the company, I'm still the owner of that policy. And so it does not change the policy if the key person leaves the company. And so what I could do is I could continue to pay the premiums and, and hope that they pass away relatively soon. <laughs> <laughs> or more likely, I'm gonna stop paying these premiums and I'm gonna cancel that policy. I'm gonna hire a new key employee and I might take out a new policy on it. I, hope, I, hope, I really hope that no one's listening on, on Zoom. They're going to be <laughs> well training you to go out and find business owners and knock off a few people. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you get to take it, or you, you get to. And then it's cash value. Cash value? Yeah. So, so maybe you cancel a policy, you take all the cash value, and, and you feel good about that. Yep. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. If that is a key person insurance, would the owner or as a beneficiary need to be a natural person or can be 
The, the owner of beneficiary can be a corporation. Absolutely, it can be the business. It doesn't have to be an individual. Okay. It could certainly be the, the organization. So would there be a legal document appointing that person to be the representative of that business? We would want to see that whoever is signing on behalf of the business has ownership of the business. So yes, we would want to see that the person who is signing is authorized to do so. Um, yes. Good question. Any other questions here? How much is that? Go ahead. How much is the minimum fee per month? Twenty-five thousand. Twenty-five thousand. And it and it really does need to be. It is designed for a key person. So just because we'll go as low as twenty-five thousand doesn't necessarily mean that every business should own twenty-five thousand dollars in coverage on all of their people, but. If I have a top salesperson and this salesperson is responsible for bringing in half of my overall revenue, well, I certainly want to take out a, a policy on that individual because they are so key to my business and my organization. I totally forgot the question. I already answered it. <laughs> you asked me a question and I forgot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And the person the life insurance, the whole age rule. Medical, everything would like everything would be the same. We're underwriting the individual based like how we would write any other individual policy. Yep. One thing that's worth pointing out, we offer that critical chronic illness rider, no extra cost for Trendsetter LB and FFIUL now. When it comes to key persons, you know, it, it is important to have protection in case the employee passes away, but what if what if the, the chef in my restaurant had a terrible slip and fall and really hurt, it, hurt himself and isn't going to be able to, to be on his feet for the next year? He has a critical illness. The owner has access to that critical illness benefit. So if my employee has a critical illness, they're going to be out for an extended period of time. Maybe I'm going to look at exercising the critical illness provision or the chronic illness provision in order to help offset some of those costs that I'm going to incur. So that's another really good feature that comes inherently on the policy for no extra cost. Any other questions on, on key person here? How do you get paid? The same as every other policy, 125% on the FFIUL. It's a pretty good deal, right? <laughs> um, Let's talk about the last one then. One more question. Yeah. Is it better to, to the, the FFIUL compared to the term? I think the FFIUL is better because you're going to build up cash value, right? And I like that a lot more, the idea that I'm building up cash value so that when my employee does leave, right, when he says, forget you, Will, I'm going to go open up my own restaurant. I'm going to go right across the street. Well, I'm going to be able to take all that cash value out and I can find my replacement and I can use that money as I see it. I think IUL is always right. Yeah. Thank you. Since Sir. it's an IUL, can the owner overfund it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, the owner can. The insured would have really no reason to overfund it themselves. Yeah. But the owner as the business, if they said, look, I'm in a, a, a business that's really up some years and is, is kind of down in other years, and this was a really good year, so let's overfund it so I can build cash value. I think that's a great plan. And so I, would, I would certainly want to do that. That'll help them with all the extra money instead of paying taxes. You can just dump it in. Yep, yep, pay it in there. Okay. Same illustration as, as a typical policy. So it's going to be the same FFIUL illustration. The big difference is going to come when you submit the application, because when you submit the application, you're going to have the owner be not the individual that's applying for the policy, but the actual business. And so that's what really makes it a key person policy is that my employee, who's key to my company is the insured, I as the business am going to be the owner, payer, beneficiary. They're just there as the insured. Physical exams for the insured, yes, absolutely. You could if you have multiple 
people that are really key to the organization. You, you could. Um, they would all have to be justified. Yep. So, so maybe if I run a sales organization and I say, well, look, this, this one individual brings in a lot more revenue to my organization, I would want to take out a larger policy on them. And then maybe someone that doesn't bring in as much revenue, maybe I would only want a small policy on that. Including the financials like who? Only if something's really out of the ordinary. So for example, if you say, look, my, my chef is my key person and he makes a half a million dollars a year. That's a lot of money for a chef, right? That's, that's, that's a lot of money. I think we would want to verify that this chef really does make that kind of income. Um, so we look at uh, standards for that occupation and we would base it all on that. Yes, sir. So the insured has to agree to a key person coverage, right? The insured would have to agree, yes. Agree. What if, you just get a scenario, what if the employee is, uh, That's a great, that's a great question. Um, not with what we're talking about here, key person, but on the next one, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Yep, good question. Is there a definition for the key person? There's not necessarily a strict guideline. I've actually got it pulled up. In our underwriting guide, we lay it out pretty clearly. Let me just read off what we've got. So you're saying So again, it's gonna be someone that has no ownership in the company, and we would want a cover letter where you explain the key person's value to the company, how the coverage amount was determined, um, and all other key persons to the organization and how much coverage they have. So there is no definition for who can be a key person. You just have to make the case as someone that knows this business or someone that knows the business owner very well. Any last questions on key persons? The number one question that I used to get, I used to exclusively do business planning cases. The number one question that we would get was, can I take this out on myself as a business owner and make it a tax deduction? And the answer to that is no. And the reason why is if I am the owner of the company, it's going to be a S corp. It's going to pass through to my personal statement. There is no sort of tax deduction that you can do on any key person. Now where we can sometimes see a tax deduction is on the next one. And the last one that we're going to talk about is an executive bonus plan. And when you think about an executive bonus plan, I want you to think about someone who is probably key to the company, similar to key person. So it's someone who is the company, they are an executive, and they are highly compensated. Now, if, if I have a business, and everything is changing very rapidly, but if I have a business, I like to provide certain benefits to my employees, right? As a business owner, I think that that's something that would be very important. So if I have a business and I am key to the company, I want to provide for my employees some sort of benefits bonus. However, if you look at plans like setting up a 401k plan for your employees, what's one of the downsides to that? If I offer it to one employee, get offered to all of them. And you know what? All of my employees are not key. There's a couple that are very key that I would consider to be executives within the company that are highly compensated, but I can't take out a 401k plan and offer this to every single client or to every single employee. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to set up an executive bonus plan. With an executive bonus plan, 
the employee is the insured. The business is just the payer and the employee, in addition to being the insured, is going to be the owner and gets to name their beneficiary. So for your question earlier of, well, if I want a portion of this to go to my family, I'm gonna talk instead about setting up an executive bonus plan for my client or for my uh, employee. This is not a real benefit to the company. I'm not the beneficiary. I'm not the owner of all of this cash value. So why would I want to set this up for one of my employees? It is tax deductible like wages. For me as the employer, I can write off the premium that I'm going to pay as a bonus to the employee and it would be tax deductible like wages would be. Everyone understand that? Yes. With an executive bonus plan, the business really serves only as the payer. So if I have someone, let's say we actually, it's on my mind, we've, uh, we've set one of these up recently for a landscaping company. And it's a massive company um, in Southern California. And they have some very unique specialties, but essentially they run in teams. And so there's one gentleman that's been with the company for the last 10 years, and he's built a really strong team that accounts for a large portion of the business. And the company is looking for additional ways to compensate this individual, but they're not going to set up a 401k plan for every single employee. And I know that in the back of the business's mind, their real fear is going to be what happens if this executive, if this key employee, what happens if he leaves and goes and sets up a competing shop right across town? Right? I don't want that to happen. I want him to feel incentivized to stay with me. This is going to be meant to compensate, retain, reward top employees. I'm going to offer for this key employee, this in my landscaping company, I'm going to offer him this executive bonus plan. And the way that I'm going to position it is we care so much about you and your well being and the well being of your family that we're going to open this policy for you. And your family is going to be the beneficiary of this policy. And as it builds cash value, you have access to that. And you know what? If you want to leave the company, you get to take the policy with you. However, if you leave the company, I'm not paying for it. You're going to have to take over ownership of, of paying for this policy. But as long as you are with this company, I'm going to continue paying the premium for this policy. And you know what, maybe we're going to have something written that establishes that if you hit your sales goal, I'll overfund it by an extra thousand dollars a month or something of that nature. It's very, very beneficial for the employer because they get to reward this top employee while also giving them a reason to stay with the company. Right? Yes, you can take it with you when you leave. It's truly a bonus for you as the employee. However, if you leave, I'm not going to pay for it anymore. You're going to have to pay for it yourself. Any questions on this? One of, minimum $25,000. One of the questions I always get on executive bonus is, again, can we take this out for someone that is the owner of their own company? And that's where it really comes down to how the taxation works, whether it's an S corp or a C corp. If it's a C corp, potentially, we actually could take this out on an owner. If it's an S corp, we could not. So a C corp, yes, we absolutely could. With an S corp, no, because an S corp is passed through. So if you write off the tax deduction as the employer, you would just be taking it as the employee. The premium is taxable to the employee like wages would be. 
we do have a really neat calculation where we can actually calculate what the tax implication would be. So let's say that I really want to pay in, math is easy on this one, I want to pay in 6000 in annual premium for my employee's policy. And let's say that I calculate the tax implications on that, and based on the extra $6,000 of income to the employee, they're going to get an extra $1,200 of tax on that, right? About 20%. So they're going to get an extra $1,200 of tax. We can actually calculate it with our software and you would not bonus just the $6,000 to the employee, but maybe you would bonus the full 7,200 so that you overcome what they're going to have to pay in additional taxes. We can go through that. It gets a little technical, but we consider this to be our small business Correct. Small business triple pie. And I'll show you, we have some good marketing material that talks about this concept. But with the small business triple play, what you're talking to them about is the fact that you can incentivize and retain a top employee. And what you're offering to them, number one, is protection in case you were to pass away too soon. Right, a 401k plan does not offer this. If you pass away tomorrow, your 401k isn't gonna pay you anything more than what you've already put away. We're gonna create an estate for you day one. So number one, protection. You're getting that first and foremost as your bonus. This is a, this is a key benefit to have, but the second part of this key small person triple play, number two, is the cash value is the fact that I as the employee am building up this cash value that I can access down the road I can access on a tax-free basis I can take it with me when I leave if I so choose to do so but I'm gonna have access to that hundred percent me as the employee number three LTC and critical I want my employee to know that 42% of new cancer patients are going to lose their entire life savings within two years or less. And with a policy like this, with the critical illness rider, you can get up to 90% of your death benefit if you have a critical illness. So I want them to know this is a policy that's going to protect you in case you pass away too soon. It's going to allow you as the employee to build more wealth to access in retirement, and it brings the critical chronic illness, long-term care benefits. Me as the employer, I'm getting this as a tax deduction and a way to retain and incentivize my company. Make sense? Yes. Questions on this one? Please. So what if the employee uh, who underwrites doesn't qualify because of some health issues that they have? I mean, you're oh, a key person, right? But yeah, you don't know if they're healthy or not. No, that's a great point. Um, you're absolutely right. We're going to underwrite this individual like we would underwrite any individual. And just because it's part of a, of a business planning case does not mean that this is going to be something that uh, we look the other way if they have a long health history or there's someone who is uninsurable, we're not going to be able to take that. So it, it, you're right. It, it is important to know regular underwriting rules and regulations do apply. Yep, good, good point. And did uh, can I go back to the people? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the employee who has a if, if the employer wants to split the beneficiary with themselves and the employee, they can do so, but know that there's no added tax benefits to it. Right? It's not like you can write off half of the premium as a tax deduction for the employee or for the employer. Um, so yes, they could, if they elect to do so, they could split it, but that's a very kind business. <laughs> um, yeah. 
you know, they have uh, the employer kind of benefits with this like equity bonus, right? It will be mainly for the employer, so you have to put in on the paper time or time, so that you will both benefit together. Sure, sure. And I do, I think I think calling on business owners is, is, a, is a great way to find new clients. One of the things that can be really difficult is getting in front of people, right? Is, is you call and you set an appointment with someone and what happens? They cancel, right? Or, oh no, I'm too busy this week. I'm not gonna be able to make it work. If you walk into a small business, the owner's gonna be there. From nine to five, probably from like seven to seven, the, the owner of the business is gonna be there. So there, there's a wealth of people that are that are available that need these kinds of solutions and they're very available and receptive to it. Anything else? Any other questions here on executive bonus? Is this helpful information? Yes. 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 I, I'm not sure if it's the same question as what Kelly James has. For executive bonus, mm -hmm. the employee is the insured the owner and can appoint the beneficiary, right? Yes. Can the employer be part of the beneficiary on an executive bonus? Can the employer be part of the beneficiary on executive bonus? Like for if the employee the wants to name them as the beneficiary, I don't know why they would. Right? I can't think of a scenario that they would. <laughs> I, I, I just love my employer so much, but I'm not naming trams as my beneficiary. Uh, that's going to my family. So because remember, all the premiums are coming from the employer. Yep. So can the employer appoint himself as one of the beneficiaries of the employee? The owner of the policy has 100% control over who the beneficiary is. So it sounds to me a little bit like you'd kind of be twisting the employee's arm a little bit. Um, so I can't, you know, you'd obviously never want to put yourself in a position for that. As long as, long as the employee is the owner and I as the business and not the owner, going to be the tax deduction for me as a business. If the employee wants to name Will Tate as the beneficiary, they can do so. A portion only, not to make sense. Make it part you know what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we would, they can name whoever they want as a beneficiary. Because an, an employer can actually tell the employee, I'm going to get an executive owner, will be the insurer, will be the owner, but can I get the 30% of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's in your dreams, my, my dear. In theory, you could. Yeah, right? The owner, the, just remember, the, the point of emphasis, the owner has 100% say over what goes on in the policy. So I could tell you, yeah, sure, you're going to be the beneficiary. You have absolutely. Uh, and then a month after the policy is issued, you know, sure, it's 100% one of my family. Uh, so it, 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 it's something that the owner has 100% authority. Or something. Good question. How about the policy? Who would get the policy? Is it the employee? The, the owner has 100% access to the cash value. Yep. Any other questions on this one? So I'd like to give you guys our, our information. If you have questions on this, it, I think it can be a little intimidating uh, approaching business owners, but we've got some really, really good fact-finding information on the Transamerica Premier website. Um, and we also have a dedicated team to help you with this. So, for the fact finder information, for all of the right questions to ask, go to Premier. This is a nice marker. That's like <laughs> Premier.transamerica.com. You're going to go to the resources tab. And underneath that, it's going to say
business planning. And we've got about seven or so PDFs there on that website under the resources section. Go to business planning. You'll see flyers on the small business triple play and what that entails. You'll see fact finders so that you can literally go through a checklist and check off all the most important questions to answer. Take that fact finder, tell the employer, hey, I'm going to do some due diligence on this. I'm going to research a variety of plans and find out what's going to fit you best. And then you're going to give us a call. You're going to tell us that you have a buy sell a key person a small business owner that you're looking to, to uh, help to assist and you're going to want to ask this guy's my favorite ask for mark jones if you want to talk about just some general ideas mark jones is our business solutions specialist. This is all that he does. He specializes in this and he is fantastic. He is not gonna be someone that's trying to push you off the phone or, or just try to, to get onto the next call. He's gonna be someone that wants to talk to you seriously about how we help this business. How do we structure the policy? How do you write the cover letter? How do you send in all the right forms so you don't have to go back to them again? Mark is fantastic. You may not be able to reach him right away. So if you're sitting down with the business, don't anticipate that if you call, Mark is just gonna magically be able to hop on the call. But if you know that you're gonna be prospecting a business and you have a day or two, give us a call. You may have to leave him a message, but he'll get back to you that day. And is someone that is just a wealth of knowledge when it comes to this. I mean, really, really impressive. I know that you'll love working with you. So give us a call. And then lastly, if there's anything that I can do, send me an email. I can't meet with the business personally, but what I'd like to do is help make sure that you have all of your questions answered so that you feel really confident when you sit down with this business owner. If it's a small business, if it's a large business, we have experience, right? Transamerica, we have about 13 million clients across the US. And most of those clients come to us from business owners. So we have a lot of experience in dealing with large businesses, small businesses, but send me an email and tell me, Will, I'm sitting down with someone, he's a restaurant owner, well, what kinds of questions do you think it's really important that I ask? I'll direct you to the resources you can use, but if you just want someone to bounce a couple of ideas off of, send me an email, give me 24 hours, and let's set a half an hour appointment so that you and I can discuss a strategy so that you're confident you're gonna close that business. That sound good? Yes. Any last questions on this before we wrap up here? Yes. Good question. Well, I don't think you need me to run the illustration because it's going to be the exact same as any individual policy would be. So, for example, if I'm looking for an 18 year old half a million dollar term policy, 20 bucks a month, right? If I'm looking for a 65 year old million dollar policy, probably around 2,500 a month. So it very much depends on the product line, the age and the risk class. Term is the cheapest. IUL is gonna be the most expensive compared to term, but it is permanent in nature. You know that you're gonna get a return on that whereas the term policy could expire. But you know what, maybe if my employer says, look, I don't have a whole lot of cash available and, and I don't know that I can, I, I know I have a key employee, but I don't know that I can afford to take out a policy on this key employee. Let's talk about the term options, right? Maybe if your employee is 40 years old, a 30 year trendsetter LD would line up really well with the need that you have for that key person coverage. 
So that's something that I know that you can you can run those illustrations and it's the exact same as any of those illustrations. Any other questions? If you call our sales desk, they will run the illustrations for you. So if you say, look, I have a 40 year old, I need a quarter million dollar term policy. You should be able to run that in under 30 seconds. But if you're not able to do so, give us a call and any one of this number can run that illustration for you. Yes, sir. There must be material for this. Sometimes you get hot back and you don't have much time to talk about it. There is. There's a ton of marketing material. Um, and I'll tell you, if you send me an email and say, Will, I need a couple of brochures to be able to share, I'd be happy to send you those brochures. Yep, we have a ton of marketing material on that. I almost, I almost sometimes wonder, I think we have more marketing material for this kind of stuff than we do for the actual product. Um, and to me, it's, it's kind of put the cart before the horse, but we've got a lot to talk about. Any last questions before we wrap up? So, for instance, if the partnership, they're married, mm -hmm. what would you, do? Because they just have to break it by well? Or? Well, what kind of business do they have? Dentistry. Dentistry. Both dentists? Yeah. Husband and wife are the only two dentists? Uh, then, yeah. Only two with ownership? No. I would set that up without involving the business at all, right? Because I'm going to name my spouse as the beneficiary. My spouse is going to name me as their beneficiary. I would set that up as a standard policy. However, if there was maybe a third, um, a third partner in the business, right? A third dentist. Well, then we each have a third of the ownership. Then I'm going to need to come up with with, with something in order to, to figure out how we pass along that ownership. Well, I know they're building. I don't know. If it's part owner also. Mm -hmm. um, Find out the ownership. Yeah. Find out the ownership on that. Um, anyone who has ownership is going to it's going to make a big difference. So if there's any other owners in the business, find out about that. Let's put a value around the organization and the business. We can help you with that. Um, but let's let's find out who all is an owner. Yeah, dentists are. We, we do a ton with dentists, doctors, lawyers. Those are those are probably the three most common. Um, also, when you're speaking with dentists, talk to them about the tax advantage that this brings right. and the fact that your only other option for building income in retirement on a tax-free basis other than IUL, what's your what's your other option? It's a Roth IRA. If you make over a certain amount of income, which dentists do, you're not going to qualify for a Roth IRA. So talk to them about this is the only solution you have as a high earner to build income in retirement on a tax-free basis. Dentists are great. All right. Well, I hope this was this was helpful information. I know that this is um, it, it's something that, that's maybe a little bit more of a of a niche market. But when you think about our solutions, I want you to think about we have something that is right for everyone, right? Whether it's a juvenile policy or a business owner or someone that's looking for long term care coverage, we've got the most versatile product that our industry has ever seen. So you need to be a little creative with how you position it, and we can be here to help. So if you go out and you prospect business owners and you talk to them, I want to be your partner in it. I want you to bring them to Transamerica. If there's anything that I can do to help earn more business for Transamerica, that's what I'm here for, to help you build your business. Sound good? Yes. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.